Let me share with you two simple actionable ideas that you'll be able to implement right after watching this video and that will instantly put you ahead of the crowd. Now let's use this position as an example. Tal is playing white against Complens and it is white to move. So what would most chess players play here if they're white? What would you play? You may think about this for a second. And by the way, of course, the same idea will apply to any other game that you play, right? This is just an example. Alright, so how would most players handle it? They would look at the pieces that you have and think like which piece should make a move and where should it go. Right? And then they come up with one move or the other. Let's say they realize that their queen is in the first rank, which is kind of old, and they decide to move it a little bit forward to make it more active, maybe to enter a b6 or whatever. And black also plays some move. Now white thinks again, okay, what do I do now? And let's say white realizes that, oh, I've got an open file, right? So I've got to stack my rooks there, and maybe they go, oh, rook d6 is a nice move, right? I can go inside with rook d6, looks cool. Now black goes rook g8, here, hopefully, white realizes that there is a threat, and they need to defend against it. And if white does not blunder that, so they play, okay, no problem, I go, let's say, rook f2 to cover this pawn. Then black goes forward with rook g3. Okay, now they realize, okay, now my queen is attacked, it's kind of annoying, I need to move it somewhere, and they do move it somewhere. And here comes rook takes h3, an unpleasant surprise. It turns out that the pawn is pinned and actually cannot move, cannot capture the rook. Therefore, you lost the pawn, you have to move the king. Now the rook comes back, then they follow up with something like pawn h3, and white goes down slowly but surely. And then... As a result of this game, I think, oh, my position was actually looking good, right? I just overlooked these nasty tactics. Maybe I gotta solve more tactical drills. But the truth is, you know, White's position was already quite unpleasant prior to these tactics. Black was attacking, this forced White to put his pieces on more defensive positions, so he was already kinda going down before these tactics even occurred. Now, let's see what Tal did instead. Actually, there was once a story where, you know, he was a famous chess player, many asked him for an autograph, and he used to sign his name there, as well as Bobby Fischer's name. And when people ask him, like, why do you do that? He said, I beat him so many times that I have the right to sign for him as well. So, quite an evil joke. Anyway, coming back to this example, he actually played the move bishop e2. What the heck, like, what's the purpose of bringing your bishop back? Well, it turns out he realized that black is going to play here this move bishop c6 and this pressure of black's bishop is gonna be annoying, right? It's gonna point towards your king and together with this semi open file, it's gonna be annoying. And therefore, he realized that and he decided to trade off this bishop. So at this point, he played bishop f3, eliminating black's single active piece, and that was basically end of story for black's attack. So now black has nothing to do. And what can black do now? I mean, his king is stuck in the center of the board, casting king side seems to be a little bit dangerous, he's got an exposed position there, so black tried to delay it for the time being, but after that, rook d3, white claims the d-file, then after that, black still wasn't sure what to do, he doesn't feel like casting, if not, it's unclear what to do, he shuffled his queen around, but then after rook c3, queen c1, white threatened either rook c8 or rook c7, so black had to castle anyway, but now rook c7, rook enters the seventh rank, attacks the queen, the pawn, Black played queen d5, here Tal played queen e1, capturing this pawn on h4, there is no way for black to defend it, the king is gonna be deadly exposed after that, and surely white won the game a couple of moves later. So the takeaway from this is that if you watch over your opponent, especially his attacking ideas, and you shut them down early on, then you're never in trouble. And like, what are the chances of white, after this maneuver, you know, to blunder anything in this game? Right, they're close to zero, because what can you possibly blunder if your opponent has no attack whatsoever, no active pieces whatsoever, right? So that's when you stop blundering, easily. But that's not the end of the story. That is, like, the first thing that I encourage you to do, to watch over your opponent's threats, okay, and to parry them early on. But as they say, there is level to things. Now, the first level is just to recognize your opponent's threats and not blunder. But the next level is to counter your opponent's threats. Alright, so let me show you another example. Let's say you're playing this game as white, and black goes for some sort of the England gambit, you accept it, knight c6, knight f3, black goes pawn d6. Now, here's the question, how would you play here if you're playing white? I think about that for a second. I mean, you'll probably notice that black is attacking this pawn and they want to capture it, and what most players do is they capture by themselves on d6. And although there is nothing terribly wrong with this move, it's good that you didn't blunder the pawn after all, but it helps black to develop his bishop, and now black has an active position, they'll go bishop g4, queen e7, castle queenside, and get quite an active game. 
Now, what do you do instead? Again, level one is to just recognize the threat and not blunder. Level two, beyond, above that, is to counter your opponent's threat. Remembering that old saying that offense is the best defense. So how do you counter that? Well, just ask yourself this question. Can I counter it somehow? And you'll then realize that, well, instead of just taking, for example, you can go bishop f4 and rather reinforce the threat along this diagonal, and it's even stronger to bring the bishop all the way out to g5 and to counter black. And now black is feeling a little bit awkward. Since your pawn e5 is still alive, they cannot play knight of 6. It will be captured. Just moving the queen to d7 also feels awkward, and they lost time, blocked their bishop. If they go bishop e7, fine, after this trade, you know, now this pawn on d6 is no longer defended by the bishop, and so if you take there, they'll be forced to create this isolated weak pawn, which will be a long-term problem for black. So by countering black's idea, you manage to seize the initiative right away and get basically a strategically winning position. Now, let's practice it a little more, because I really want that you develop this skill and start using it, okay? Now, let's take a look at this position, very common, the fried liver attack, and here after black goes pawn to d5 to shut down this bishop, white captures, black goes knight a5, this is still theory, bishop b5 check to the king, pawn to c6, and here, oops, after pawn takes c6, uh, there is an interesting way for white to play queen f3, if white wants to be like hyper aggressive, he may wish to play this move. Now the point is he's putting more pressure onto this pawn, but also the queen x raised the rook, therefore if pawn moves, you're gonna lose this rook in the corner. Now, what do you do here if you're playing black? Once again, think about this position and then try to apply things that we're learning. So let's see if you can already find new moves that you wouldn't find earlier. Okay. Now, most players would realize that there is a threat of white capturing this pawn, so that is level one. You realize a pawn's threat, you do not blunder. But what most players do actually is they play a bit of a dull move bishop to b7, putting their bishop in prison, although it defends the pawn nice, but the bishop also becomes kind of like a tall pawn. Now, the level two is you start looking for counters, right? So you start thinking to yourself, okay, can I go bishop g4 maybe? Well, in this case, why well, I can still capture on c6 and it's checked to the king, so bishop g4 may not be optimal. Now, what else can I do? I can go h6, let's say, it's counter in the knight. Okay, that's interesting. So let's calculate the line. If he takes the, the pawn, we recapture, queen takes, check to the king. Now, what do I do now? Well, I gotta go bishop d7, right? Counter the check, and as well as my queen now defends the rook, and at the end of this line, we can see that the queen is attacked, but also the knight on g5, and white will inevitably lose one of these two pieces, probably the knight, and we got a winning position. And by the way, the same idea applies for the middle game and end game just as well. For instance, in this game played between uh, Tatabai against Legno, a white player rook to d1, black found a way to snatch this pawn on a2 as well as to attack this bishop. Now, once again, you can train this if you will. So how would you play here if you're white? I mean, there is a threat to the bishop, right? There is also some pressure to this knight. So most players would try to address those threats. They would either try to trade off the knight or try to move the bishop away just to save it. Now, what do you do instead? Well, you're asking yourself, how do I counterattack, remembering that offense is the best defense? And you first try to look for counterattacking options, and only if you cannot find anything, then you settle for a passive defensive move. Now, so what are the counterattacking options of white potentially here? Can you attack something or capture something? I mean, bishop g7 is the move that is worth considering, but here after king takes g7, it's not all that clear how to follow up to that. Anyway, you may think about that for a second. There is a much simpler option, queen takes f5, where you grab the pawn, attack the rook in the, on c8, so that looks like the best option for white to play. And here white is just winning. Besides queen takes f5, actually, you also have got the rook to d7 move, which was played in the game, which is also quite strong. Now, he's attacking your bishop, you're attacking his bishop, but also your rook is now extremely active along the 7th rank. For instance, if this bishop moves somewhere, right, together with, the, with uh, this bishop from b2, you can actually de deliver this deadly attack against his king, and again, you're just winning. So, you see that in this position, you even had two counter-attacking moves, which most players would clearly overlook. Now I hope that you can see how you can get ahead of the crowd easily. But of course, I don't dare to say that knowing this single idea is enough to really bring you all the way to the expert level. So if you want to do that, I've got a dedicated course, 3 Steps to 2000 ELO, where I'm guiding you and showing you everything that you need to know in order to get to that rating of 2000. So if you're curious now, you can click the link on the screen or down below in the description, and I'll be happy to guide you along the way of that chess progress so that you get this kind of smooth progress in chess. So again, if you're curious, click link below and I'll be happy to help you. 
Otherwise, have a great rest of the day and I'll talk to you soon.